What's up, punks? Welcome to vlog number three. For this one, we did a short session at Rivers Casino in Philadelphia. It was a short session because before the session, we actually went and saw Field Day, and we were able to sit down with their bass player, Doug Carrion, and do a little interview, find out a little bit more about the band. Doug was also the bass player for The Descendants and for Dag Nasty back in the late 80s. So he's been one of the guys who's been in a lot of bands that I really liked over the years. So it was great to sit down with Doug and to get to learn a little bit more about his musical journey. Uh, so that's why the session ended up being short. Not too many hands in this one, but I highlighted the you know important ones from the session. Uh, vlog number four will be coming soon. That has a lot of great hands from a session that I played just about a week ago. So that one's in queue to be edited. So without any further ado, let's get on to the hands. In this session so far, we haven't really had much going on. We bought in for an original $500. We were down to about a little over 300 when we looked down at pocket sixes in the low jack. Under the gun leads for 15, middle position calls, I call with the sixes, and then a cutoff min clicks is to 30. The small blind and big blind both fold, under the gun, middle position, and I all call. So with 127 in the pot, we go to a flop of six of clubs, 10 of diamonds, king of clubs. This looks good to me, but I'm still worried about this hand. So when it checks to me, I check to the cutoff, who's the original aggressor. He bets 45. The under the gun folds, and then the middle position player raises to $100. This seems a little weak to me because it is a min click, uh, or just above a min click, really. I think about it for a minute, and I think the best course of action here is to shove, so I shove for 274. The cutoff insta mucks. The middle position player thinks about it for a minute and eventually calls. The turn card is the eight of clubs. At this point, I think there is a good chance that I'm beat, seeing as though he could have been calling me with a flush draw. The river card is the four of clubs, and at this point, I definitely think I'm beat because how is he going to call without at least one club? To my surprise, he turns over Ace of Spades, King of Diamonds, and we are good. We are off to the races, finally scooping a pot in this game, which has been tough for us so far. The next thing we look down at is Pocket Queens. We have two black queens from middle position. Under the gun limps, we raise to 15. The hijack, the small blind, the big blind, and the limper all call. So with $75 in the pot, we go to a flop of Jack-8-7 with the 8-7 of diamonds. We lead out for 15 when it's checked to us, thinking that we need to see where we're at. The hijack then raises us to $50. It folds around back to me, and I just call. The turn is a four of diamonds, which is definitely a card I don't like. I check to the hijack, and he bets $60. This is definitely a, a bet that he could be making with a hand like Ace-Jack, Jack-10, Jack-9, so we call. The river card is the worst card we could ask for in the Queen of Hearts. Now we have top set, we have much too strong a hand to just check fold. We could lead out and just fold if we get raised, but we decide to check. The hijack bets out $110, and we just have too strong a hand to fold, so we make the crying call. The hijack then turns over the queen 10 of diamonds. He turned the flush. We rivered the set. We couldn't get away from it. So we ship all those chips that we just won in the last hand off to the wrong guy. Okay, the next hand that we look down at is king jack offsuit. We are in the big blind. A middle position player makes it 15. The hijack and the button both call. When it comes around to us, we just flat. We are not looking to bloat this pot out of position. So uh, flop comes off. King jack four, rainbow. We check thinking that we can check raise the aggressive player and get stacks in. And unfortunately he checks and it checks through. Uh, the nine diamonds comes on the turn. At this point, we are looking to take this pot. We think we're the best. So we bet out 45, hoping that somebody could call maybe with a 10, maybe with a queen and try and get some value. To our surprise, the middle position player who was the pre-flop aggressor raises to 100. He's got about another 200 behind. And even more to our surprise, the hijack just flat calls. At this point, the button folds, it's back on us. We're thinking that we're probably good here. And 
the hijack has about 350 behind. We're trying to figure out how to get all of that in the pot. We decide to rip it in for 345, thinking that's about what the hijack has. The middle position player who was the preflop aggressor calls for 227. This is when the hijack goes into the tank. He is in there for a good minute to a minute and a half thinking over his options. I'm thinking, I want you to call because if it's taking you this long to call, then I must have you beat. So he eventually does shove for 358 more. We were off on our estimate of what he had in his stack by about $113, but we make that call every day, all day, thinking that we've got top two, we must be good. The, the river card is nine of hearts, which shouldn't change anything. If we were ahead, we should still be ahead. But unfortunately, we find out that Mr. Tank had pocket jacks. I don't think he was slow rolling us. I think he was seriously considering folding. I just think he was, you know, scared by the monster under the bed if I had queen 10. But he scooped a massive pot here and we learned a little bit about him and figure we can try and push him off pots in the future if he's willing to fold middle set. So that was the last hand we had that was interesting, unfortunately. It was a short session. We were in for a thousand. We were out for 533. So we were actually 477 to the downside. We'll get them next time. But uh, remember, like, subscribe, hit that alert. So that way you're notified when new videos come out. And now, no further ado, I'm going to bring you the interview with Mr. Doug Carrion of Descendants, Dag Nasty, Field Day. So here you go. I think one of the things that's really impressive about Field Day is that we play that era of music the Can I Say, The Wig Out, some of the songs from the Green Field Day record that worked live. True to form. It's freaking nuts. So that's what's been kind of amazing is that for me, because I stood on the bandstand, I knew what the 87 band sounded like. The 2021-2022 band fucking crushes, just crushes. It's incredible and Peter and I are always like we talk about this Peter and I talk about this and we're like when we a B live here's a recording we did in 1987 at CBGB's <laughs> and we listen to it, we go that sounds pretty good this flat da, 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 da. and we listen to our live shows here we go dude we it's like whoop, 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 whoop. we just moved the bar up which is kind of rad so the, I guess my point is that anybody that comes out to see it because they want to hear those songs, by no means do they get like hustled into it. Like we don't phone that shit in at all. It's real. It's as serious as a heart attack, like do or die. Oh, that's great. And, it's, and people love those songs. We love those songs. That's why we decided to do it. But Field Day does not take on the Dag Nasty material lightly. Like we do it true to form as hard and aggressive as we can in fact dot 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 we play that shit faster why because <laughs> that's what the ramones would do <laughs> so i couldn't be happier with the reception and just stoked at how freaking gnarly the band is the band's yeah. just freaking dragon slayer it's well, it's gnarly it's, it's gnarly i'll tell you from my perspective it's so good to see guys still have the fire you know not just for the old stuff but right. for the new stuff coming in and, and and have that passion still you know in our our, our midlife well you know what's why what we are the motto in the band is be humble and don't suck people are more like holy shit holy goose i mean i've had to it's a, it's very different like i've had to navigate around people crying oh wow that's what i'm where you go wait a minute i'm making a 45 year old guy cry what's the deal like are you okay those records are they're like up there with 
you know, minor threat in the Ramones <laughs> in the sense that uh, they they burrowed into it, people's freaky, hearts and they've freaky. stayed there for and we, 35 like, years. Like I said, we love the songs and we we are obligated to do them to the best of our ability and we do that and not to call out Toby Morris, but I will say we made Toby Morris cry. Like I saw him cry. We were doing we were doing a hit in Oakland and um, playing. Now I have pretty good radar and I'm watching what's going on. I can see people, blah, 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 blah. And I'm watching a guy over to the side. He's on guitar side stage right. And I can see him kind of down. He's going, blah, blah, blah. After the show, he says to me, he's like, hey Matt, I ask him, I'm like, are you okay? And he's like, I'm okay. He asked me to sign the set list to a buddy of his who had died. Whoa. And I'm like, whoa. And he's like, my friend, Michael and I used to come out and see you guys. Blah, 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 blah. I saw you at Gilman Street. I saw you, da, 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 da. I saw you at the press club. So that's the thing is that it, it strikes a chord with people, sometimes teleporting them back to when they were like, I used to listen to you on my Sony Walkman delivering newspapers. Yep. So seeing as though we are a poker vlog, yes. I, I am going to get into that for a little bit okay, real quick. Sure. So being from LA, LA is like secondary, second poker city in the, in the States, you know, next to Las Vegas. There's poker rooms everywhere. Yes. Do you play ever? I don't play poker at all. So, um, I don't, I, it's not that it's not, it's not that it escapes me that way, but it's like, I work so hard for my money that the last thing I want to do is gamble <laughs> it away. I met a guy who intentionally lives in Mexico so he can do online poker and gamble it. Yeah. So it's a thing. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot of guys who, especially when they run the big tournament series, they, they'll go to Canada or Mexico yes. because, you know, the U.S. with their, you know, puritanical laws yeah. has decided we're not worthy. So they'll go outside the country. Yeah do their thing yep. and then come back and do their thing back home when it's all over. Yeah, I do. Uh, every once in a while, I get some songs on World Poker Tour because one of my hats that I wear is getting music on films and stuff like that. So every once in a while, I get on that. All right, so on I'm going to listen. On the World Poker Tour. I'm going to listen for a Field Day song. No, no, next it's not season. Field Day. Oh, it's more like on. scorey kind of stuff. Like, no. They, like, they don't... Just do, just do the instrumental part. Right. They'll never know. 